Thanks, Rod, and uh, thanks everyone for coming this morning. Good morning. Is the audio okay? Good. Uh, so, as Rod said, this research of mine has been going on for a little while now, and actually it started back in 2007, 2008, uh, with a group of orthopaedic surgeons in Melbourne and a couple of researchers from a small university in Melbourne. And uh, I think it really came out of, like I think many of you in the room, uh, I've had lots of injuries throughout my sporting career and I have been very active um, and still am very active. So that was really what got me interested in this whole idea of returning to play and uh, particularly after serious injury. So I'm going to be talking today about return to play. I'm going to use the model of ACL reconstruction really for two reasons. The first is because this is where most of the literature is. And the second is because that's the group of the surgeons that I've been working with really specialise in ACL reconstruction. So uh, we've been very lucky to have that collaboration. The other thing to keep in mind is that I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm um, going to be talking about athletes and when I talk about athletes I'm really referring to uh, non-professional athletes and the reason for doing this is again most of the literature is in that area but also because I think there are some um, important distinctions between non-professional athletes and professional <coughs> athletes in terms of the return to play and the factors influencing their return to play. So let's get started. And actually, there's really a lot of experience in the room. And I would like to ask you the question, what do you think is the most challenging thing about for an athlete for returning to play after an injury or returning to sport? And you don't necessarily have to shout out an answer, but it's something that I'd like you to keep in the back of your mind as we go through the talk. And today, I would really like to share with you what I think is particularly important and particularly challenging for athletes, and that is regaining the confidence to return to play and also to get over that nagging feeling of anxiety about getting a new injury. And I think the principles here, while I'm talking about ACL reconstruction, the principles really apply for any kind of serious time loss injury, whether it be a shoulder reconstruction or a, a severe ankle sprain. Something that requires a long period of rehabilitation might also require surgery. So first, first up, for those in the room who may not be as familiar with the ACL, uh, this is the, front, the frontal plane view of the knee with the patella removed. And the ligament that we're talking about is this one here. This, there's two intra-articular cruciate ligaments and the one that attaches to the anterior aspect of the tibia is the ACL. And the ACL is typically injured in a non-contact mechanism in about three quarters of cases. It's non-contact. And as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, typically it's when the athlete is pivoting, changing direction on a flexed knee, they tend to rotate and fall into this dynamic valgus or this valgus collapse position and whoops sorry this is what it looks like if I can get this to play so here we're looking at the right knee so as he lands on his right foot he pivots and then the knee falls into valgus and he ruptures his ACL and I chose that video of that particular player because he's a, a really interesting story recently in Melbourne. We're a bit AFL mad in Melbourne and uh, he's actually had four ACL reconstructions since the age of about 19 and it took him 1450 days to return to play. Uh, and actually on the basis of his first game back a few months ago, he, was, he signed, a, signed a brand new contract. So the often for athletes particularly involved in pivoting sports, the indication or they're, they're uh, advised to go and have surgery. So the other indication for surgery is symptomatic instability. And this might be for people who find that their knee gives way on them when they're walking or having a shower or going up and down stairs. And usually the surgeons will take 
uh, part of either the athlete's own patella or hamstring tendon to reconstruct the ruptured ligament. So let's start by looking at the expectations that people have of an ACL reconstruction. So they expect to be able to return to their pre-injury level sport and they expect that this will happen within one year of having surgery. They also expect to have normal or nearly normal knee function and little to no increased risk of osteoarthritis. And I think this is interesting because before the athlete even comes into your office, there's some expectations there in their mind and we might need to think about this and consider whether these expectations are realistic. And today, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the first two. So we'll talk about return to play rates and also what the timing of return to play. So this was a meta-analysis that we updated. We, the original meta-analysis we did back in 2011 and we updated it last year. We had the results of 69 studies and what we found was that, sorry, four out of five athletes returned to some kind of sport at some time after their primary ACL reconstruction. So this is only after the first ACL reconstruction they've had. Two thirds of them returned to their pre-injury level sport at some time after their surgery. But interestingly, only one out of every two of them returned to competitive sport. And we were a little bit surprised by this. We actually thought the rate of return to play would be a bit higher. So the next question is, well, when do these people get back to play? And this was a group of athletes that we had sub-elite competitive athletes. They all played pivoting sports before their ACL reconstruction. And we recruited them from the orthopaedic clinic in Melbourne. And what we did was to follow them as part of their routine clinical uh, follow-up for one year. And at one year, we asked them, have you returned to play at your pre-injury level? And a little bit surprisingly, only one out of every three of them said that they had. We then thought, well, okay, maybe it's just one year is a little bit too early. Maybe we need to give these people a little, a little bit of extra time and they will then return to play. So we looked a little bit later. We followed this group. It was not, uh, not quite the same number of patients, but it was a very similar cohort and they were at five to seven years after their surgery. At an, at, and the whole group was an average of three years. So at that average of three years, we found that two out of three of them had returned to play at their pre-injury level at some time in that follow-up period. But when we asked them, are you still playing? There was only one out of every three of them who said yes, they were still playing their pre-injury level sport. So what we took this to mean was that there are many athletes who actually need longer than a year to get back to that pre-injury level. And it also means that if you have an athlete come into your clinic sitting in front of you at one year after their surgery, they haven't returned to play, it doesn't mean that they will never return to play. But equally, there seems to be a peak in the return to play rate and it seems to happen sometime within the one and two year time points and then we get a decline again and we don't know whether these people stop playing sport altogether whether they retire or perhaps they change sports and this is something that we're starting to look at with our research ongoing research so the question really is and this was what i was particularly interested in for my phd why are these people not getting back? If the main reason that most of these athletes are having an ACL reconstruction is because they want to get back to their pre-injury pivoting sports, why on earth are so many of them not actually doing this? One out of three is, is uh, quite a lot who are not returning to the pre-injury level. And I think the first thing we thought about was maybe it's got to do with their physical function. I think it's reasonable to think that if you have poor surgery or if you have poor rehabilitation, then perhaps your knee just doesn't have the capability 
to cope with the demands of playing, particularly at pivoting sports, high demand. And so we looked at this in the meta-analysis and we put all of the available clinical data into a meta-analysis and what we found was that actually people do pretty well after their surgery based on standard clinical assessments. So they recover hop test symmetry to at least 85%, so they can hop at least 85% as far on their operated leg compared to their non-operated side. They have sym symmetrical muscle strength, so on average they have at least 90% of the muscle strength in their quadriceps and hamstrings side to side. They also have stable knees when they're assessed with static laxity tests. So. Of course, the assumption here is that people have had good surgery, but I think that we can, we can say that based on our current clinical assessments, people are doing pretty well. So there's a whole lot of athletes with apparently good knee function, and they're not returning to play. Now, I think we can argue, and I'm very happy to talk about the potential limitations of some of these clinical tests. Maybe these tests are not sensitive enough. But the point is that based on the tests that we're using in clinical practice, these people are doing well physically. But, and this is I think particularly important, we might need to consider what the athletes think. So objective measures of physical function have been shown not to not necessarily relate to the athlete's perceptions of their function. And I think this is really nicely illustrated in this meta-analysis here, or this forest plot. So when we put all of the data that we have together, and admittedly there's not that many studies, when we put it all together, what we find is that there's a large effect favorite for positive self-reported knee function favoring returning to the pre-injury <coughs> level of sport. So the better you think your knee is, the more likely you are to get back to your pre-injury level. So that's physical function. There are also some contextual factors that might influence returning to play. And there's a whole group of factors that are, potent, that are non-modifiable. So the first one is age, and age does have a really important impact on returning to play, particularly for uh, older athletes. So if you are aged 25 or less, at the time of your ACL injury, you're 50% more likely to get back to your pre-injury level compared to someone who's aged over 25. And there might be a whole lot of reasons for this. Maybe young athletes have more opportunities to play sport. Their whole social network and lifestyle is really structured around playing sport. Perhaps they have fewer commitments for work and with families. If you're a man, you are 40% more likely to get back to your pre-injury level compared to women. But interestingly, returning to play in any kind of sport, there's no difference between men and women. And certainly if you're an elite level athlete, you are at least twice as likely to get back to your pre-injury level sport compared to your non-elite peers. So this is all fine, and I think it's, it's important to keep in mind, but the point is that we can't actually do much about these factors. We can't really change them. But what I've been particularly interested in is factors that we might be able to change. And I think the things that uh, might be most amenable to change are the psychological responses. And this is pretty nicely illustrated in this meta-analysis. So when we combine the data, there are, there are essentially two factors that have been most researched in this area. The first is fear of re-injury. And when we put the data together for fear of re-injury, and again, admittedly, there's not a huge amount of research in this area, but it's growing, and it's, it's been growing quite rapidly recently. When we combine it all, we find that there is a moderate to large effect for low fear of re-injury, favoring returning to the pre-injury level of sport. So the less concerned you are about getting a new injury, the more likely you are to return to your pre-injury level. 
And the second factor is psychological readiness to return to sport. And this has been measured with a, an ACL-specific questionnaire that was developed by my colleagues in Melbourne. And again, when we put the data together here, we find there's a large effect for positive psychological response favouring returning to the pre-injury level. And I think this is where we can get a whole lot better with our rehabilitation. And I'm going to go into, into that a little bit more in a second. I want to just touch on the fear of re-injury though. And I think it's, it's important. And it's actually, when we talk to athletes who don't return to their pre-injury level, fear of re-injury is the number one reason that they say uh, influence their decision. So between a quarter and half of athletes who don't return to their pre-injury level sport say that the main reason was because they were worried about a new injury. And I think this is particularly pertinent for the non-professional athlete. Professional athletes have maybe uh, scholarships or salaries or endorsements. They have a medical team who's really devoted to getting them back to play. They have a lot of uh, motivation to get back to play. But for our non-professional athletes, they've got a life outside of sport that they have to consider. And I think this is summed up really nicely by this quote. I couldn't afford to get hurt in the same way again. I'm self-employed, so no work means no bills get paid. So people really take into account a whole lot of other aspects when they are making decisions about their return to play. And so I think my message is that the mind really does matter when we're talking about return to play. And it matters not just when we're looking at ACL injuries, it matters in all athletic injuries. So when we look at all of the li available literature that examines the association between psychological factors and returning to play, we find that the psychological factors are important. So athletes who are more self-motivated have more confidence more positive mood and emotions, and who are more psychologically ready to return to play, they are the ones who get back to their pre-injury level. They also return more quickly, and they have a more positive perception of their return to play. So they feel that their return to play in terms of their performance was more successful. And performance is important because athletes don't just want to get back on the field. They don't want to just stand there. They want to know that they can perform at the same level as they could before their injury. And it's interesting because looking at the literature, there's really not a lot that looks at performance after returning to play from an ACL reconstruction. And the literature that is there is exclusively in professional sport and exclusively based on statistics. So things like points scored, assists, goals, distance covered. And it's a bit conflicting. So there are some studies, a couple of studies, that show a reduction in performance statistics compared to non-injured controls. But equally, there are a few studies that also show no difference. So the injured athletes had exactly the same performance statistics compared to their non-injured counterparts when they had returned to play. So we really need some more research in this area. And particularly, we need to focus on how these athletes assess their own performance. So it's all fine to look at statistics, but statistics may be meaningful or meaningless, depending on the status of the game. If there are rule changes, perhaps the game style changes, and it, and it changes the importance of statistics. So we really need to know a lot more and need more research on how athletes assess their performance after returning to play. So let's take a step right back. I want to go right back to the beginning now and look at the progression from injury through rehabilitation. And there are a whole lot of psychological responses that happen when the athlete first gets injured and I'm sure if people in the room have had a serious injury before, you might recognise some of these psychological responses. Certainly I do. And so there's, it's a real roller coaster, and this roller coaster continues throughout rehabilitation and right through the return to play. <laughs> 
And if we ask an injured athlete, a first time injured athlete, never had a serious injury before, if we ask them to draw what they think their recovery would look like when they're first injured, they might draw something like this. So with this linear improvement over time, linear consistent improvement over time. But really, I think what you and I both know, if not from our own experience of injury, certainly from working with injured athletes, is that the recovery, the road to recovery, actually looks a lot more like this, with steps forward and back, roadblocks in the way, times where the progression happens quickly and times where it's slow. And it's important to keep this in mind, I think, because it certainly influences the psychological response. And the research shows that when the injury first occurs, we have this really, this peak in negative emotional response. I've got fear here on the y-axis. You could really substitute that for any negative emotional response. As the athlete then starts their rehabilitation, they progress through their rehabilitation, they start to feel a bit better. The negative stuff reduces, they become a bit more positive. But we get, again get this second peak around about the time that athletes are transitioning back to sport. And I'm sure you've probably seen this in athletes that you've worked with. And some athletes find this negative response here is a huge hindrance to their return to play. It really impacts on their return to play. Others say that they feel the fear, but they use that as motivation. It's almost like, I'm just going to do this, prove to myself that I can do it. And then once they get back, they find that the fear, it's almost like they've tested their injured knee and it's held up and that helps to reduce the negative emotional response. So these are some of the thoughts that might go through the injured athlete's mind during rehabilitation, but particularly at that transition time back to play. So questioning, can I still play? Can I get back to that same performance level? Can I trust my knee? Is it going to hold up? And the concerns of injured athletes can really be grouped into three themes. And I think it's useful to think about these themes because it can give us some clues about how we might think about intervening in rehabilitation, how we might address some of these factors in rehabilitation. So the first theme is competence. And competence relates to an athlete's perception of their proficiency or their effectiveness in terms of sporting performance. And so they talk about this anxiety, fear of re-injury, and we've talked, I've talked about that already. They talk about being concerned about whether they can perform at the same level and their self-presentation. So are they going to be fit enough, strong enough? Will they be able to execute their skills in the same way as before their injury? Or will they just look silly and the coach won't pick them for the next game? The second theme is relatedness. And relatedness is really about the athlete's perception of feeling part of the team environment, feeling part of a social network. And they talk about social isolation when they're injured. And particularly for young athletes, they have concerns about losing their sense of being an athlete, their sense of athletic identity. And that's a huge problem for them and really impacts on their confidence. And athletes also talk about lacking the social support that they feel they need during their re rehabilitation and return to play. And finally, the third theme is autonomy. And autonomy is about the athlete's perception of feeling in control of their return to play. And they often talk about feeling pressure from their coach, particularly, but this pressure can also come from family members, friends outside of sport, their teammates. Pressure to return to, the, to play before they're ready. So wouldn't it be cool? I think it would be really, really cool if we could use this information in rehabilitation to identify who might be at risk of not returning to play. I think as a clinician, that would be incredibly useful because then I could really individually tailor the rehabilitation that I do with, with some of these athletes. And I want to share with you now some of the research that we've done in Melbourne to explore this idea a little bit. 
So we had a group of 187 competitive and recreational level athletes. They were all playing regular sport before their injury, at least twice a week, and they'd all had an ACL reconstruction. Sorry. We asked them to complete an online questionnaire, and we were particularly interested in their psychological responses. And we asked them to complete this in the week before they had surgery, and then again at four months after their ACL reconstruction. So in that really intensive impairment focused rehabilitation phase. And because we know that psychological responses are really variable, very individual, we assessed a range of different factors to try and cover some of the variability. We looked at psychological readiness to return to sport using the questionnaire that I talked about earlier. We looked at fear of re-injury, emotions and mood, motivation to return to play, locus of control, which is really the athlete's perception of being in control of their return to play or whether they, there were external factors that essentially made the decision. And we looked at recovery expectations. And for recovery expectations, we asked people to estimate how long they thought it would take to return to play. And so at one year, we looked at our primary outcome was returning to the pre-injury level at one year after an ACL reconstruction. And we found there were three key psychological responses that predicted returning to play, who would be playing their pre-injury sport at one year. Psychological readiness to return to sport was important here. And actually, it was the strongest predictor of returning to play at one year after surgery. And athletes who were more psychologically ready to return to play were up to eight times more likely to get back to their pre-injury level. Locus of control was important and the athletes with a more internal locus of control, so they felt more in control of their recovery and rehabilitation, they were up to 50% more likely to get back to their pre-injury level at one year. And the athletes who estimated it would take longer to return to play were actually less likely to get back. So for every one month increase in the length of time that they thought it would take to get back to sport, the chances of returning reduced by about 20%. And just in case you're not convinced, we also looked at the data at two years. So again, uh, for, this cohort, for this study, we took the group of athletes who had not returned to play at their pre-injury level at one year. So there are 120 athletes who had not returned to their pre-injury level at one year. We asked them at one year to complete the same psychological outcome measures. And we looked at the relationship between those responses at one year and playing pre-injury level sport at two years. And we found, again, there were two key psychological responses. The athletes who were more psychologically ready to return to play at one year were more likely to be playing their pre-injury level sport at two years. And the people who had higher self-motivation to return were more likely to be playing sport at two years. So why is this important? Why should we care about this information? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. And the first is that the psychological responses can, very early on, so even before these athletes have had an ACL reconstruction, can give us an indication of how they're likely to go in terms of their return to play. And as a clinician, I think this is particularly interesting and useful because it's at a time when measuring physical function may not give us the same information. So there's some potentially important information that you can glean about the, an athlete's chances of returning to play even before they've had surgery. And that's fine, but what do we do with it? Can we use this information to uh, inform interventions? Are there any interventions that are useful here? And certainly this is what I'm exploring now in my research and something that we're looking at in some multi-centre research between Melbourne and Sweden.
So I think the first thing is to consider a couple of questions. You have an athlete in front of you in your office. Is the athlete at risk of not returning to play? You might ask or think about three questions. Think about how psychologically ready are they to return to play? Are they totally freaking out? Is this the first time they've had a serious injury? They're really worried about their performance or really worried about a new injury. How long do they think it's going to take? Ask them the question. How long, what's their recovery going to be like? Maybe they haven't even thought about their expectations for recovery and return to play. They might just think it's going to happen automatically. It definitely doesn't. And the third thing to think about is, does that athlete feel like they are in control of the return to play? Or is, are they being dictated to by their coach or their parents? And I would respectfully suggest that perhaps we need some new approaches to rehabilitation. We know that psychological factors are potentially modifiable. We know that they have a big influence on returning to play. But when you look at the published clinical guidelines for rehabilitation after an ACL reconstruction, there's nothing in there about psychological factors or psychological interventions. And this is definitely not to say that there aren't some excellent clinicians doing fantastic work and addressing psychological responses in their rehabilitation. There are, and I've seen these clinicians work and they do excellent work. But the point is that they're missing from the guidelines. So if you are following the published clinical guidelines, you may not even be considering psychological factors. And I think we need to look at this question with research, and this is what we're doing now, is can we intervene in rehabilitation and influence the return to play? We actually don't know the answer to that question. There's been no research looking at a psychological intervention and return to play after an ACL reconstruction or after a serious injury in general. So I've got a couple of suggestions that you might already be doing in your rehabilitation or in your work with injured athletes. And these have come from the literature, so is, there is some evidence to suggest that these interventions can help improve outcomes, psychological outcomes in rehabilitation. So they can help reduce pain, improve psychological readiness to return to play, and reduce fear of injury. And I think it's useful to think about these interventions in terms of the three themes of, of concerns for injured athletes that I talked about earlier. So that first theme, if you remember, is competence. And competence relates to how the athlete feels about their efficiency, their, or their proficiency, and their effectiveness in performance. So there is some evidence to suggest that modeling techniques, so pairing injured athletes with rehabilitated athletes, or pairing athletes who are further along in their rehabilitation with newly injured athletes can be quite effective. It's almost like a buddy system, and that rehabilitated athlete is acting like the guide, showing the newly injured athlete the ropes, showing them how to get through the rehabilitation. Confidence building is very important and athletes talk about confidence as being the number one thing when uh, related to their psychological readiness to return to play. So setting specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time limited goals for return to play, but also for performance. And related to performance is using progressive functional and fitness testing at time points throughout the rehabilitation so that that athlete knows exactly where they're up to and where they need to go. There's also some evidence that relaxation, mental practice and imagery techniques can be quite effective for reducing re-injury anxiety. The second theme that I talked about was relatedness. And if you remember, relatedness is about that social connection, feeling connected to the team. And I think as practitioners and clinicians, we do the social support stuff without even thinking about it. These athletes get, build a really strong relationship with us. We see them so often and we become almost like their psychologists. They, they confide in us. They tell us their concerns and their fears. And certainly don't underestimate the 
importance of doing that, of listening and providing emotional support. Also providing good information to the injured athlete about their rehabilitation and also about their return to play. Another thing to consider is designing some rehabilitation content that might be able to be done safely within the team training environment. So that might help injured athletes to stay connected to their team. Now there are some athletes who don't want to be involved with the team at all and that's fine, but this might be something that could work for particular athletes. Oops. And the final theme that I talked about was autonomy, so that idea of the athlete being in control of the return to play and making the decision about the return to play. So certainly discuss discussions with coaches, reducing that perceived pressure to return before the athlete is ready and having a collaborative rehabilitation approach. So providing really clear rationales to the athlete for why you're choosing particular treatments, particular exercises, particular interventions. You might think about giving the athlete a, a kind of rehabilitation menu. So give them some choices and options for different exercises that will all achieve the goal that you want to achieve, but the athlete chooses what they do in that session or in that block of sessions. So there are three key messages that I would like you to uh, take from this presentation. The first is that there are some important conversations to have and the earlier you can have them, the better. Ideally, if you're seeing a, an athlete who's having an ACL reconstruction before they have surgery, ask them what are their goals and expectations. Then think about whether these goals and expectations match with what we know? What does the evidence say about these expectations? Are they realistic? Do we need to talk with the athlete about these goals and expectations? And then you might ask them the question and talk to them about how you and the injured athlete can work together to achieve the goals. Keep in mind that not all athletes will return to their pre-injury level sport and this is okay. I think for a long time we became obsessed with return to play as being the benchmark for successful ACL reconstruction and I think we need to move away from that and recognise that there are many reasons why athletes don't return to their pre-injury level sport and it's not because they've had bad surgery or bad rehabilitation. It might be that they going back to playing football is not high on their priority list anymore. They'd prefer to swim or cycle. So goals and priorities of athletes may change and they may change throughout rehabilitation. What the athlete thinks that they want to do at the beginning of rehabilitation might be totally different to what their priorities are after nine months of rehabilitation. And finally, psychological responses matter for rehabilitation and certainly for return to play. And I really hope I've been able to convince you of the importance of considering psychological factors in rehabilitation. Thanks very much.